Welcome to Haverhill United Methodist Church. It's great to have you with us. My name is David Palmer. I'm the pastor of the Woodsville and North Haverhill United Methodist Churches. We're glad that we could worship together today. Today is a very special day in the life of the church. Today is Pentecost, the day we celebrate the gift of the Holy Spirit that has been given to the church by God. And as we celebrate together, we'll hear more about the Holy Spirit and the life of the Holy Spirit for the church together. A few things I want to draw your attention to is first, if you would, uh, like and subscribe this page. Uh, it will help us to continue to connect with you and you'll be able to hear more of our activities through the work of the church as we continue together. Also, I invite you to visit our website, haverillumc.org, and you'll find there many opportunities to continue to connect with the church throughout the week. We have small group opportunities, uh, classes on the Holy Spirit that we're currently working with, as well as ministry and service opportunities as we connect with our community at large. And as we continue in our time of worship together, I invite you to sit back and to look to God to hear and receive what the Lord would have for you this day. Amen. invite you to read with me a prayer that is designed for today, a prayer to the Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit and they shall be created and you shall renew the face of the earth. Amen. Today we have two scripture readings I'd like to share with you. The first is our traditional reading from Acts 2, talking about the day of Pentecost. Today, I'll invite you to watch the video that has been shared with us from Ohio. A uh, church there did a great job of providing reading with many different languages incorporated into that scripture reading. So enjoy that video as we worship together this morning. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. Ils virent apparaître comme une sorte de feu qui se partageait en langue et qui se posa sur chacun d'eux. Y fueron todos llenos del Espíritu Santo y comenzaron a hablar en otras lenguas, según el Espíritu les daba que hablasen. 
Тора олосто козло смени сто Жерусалем. И Христос вовате евреос, ала олосто козмос оранос. Когда сделался этот шум, и собрался народ, и пришел в смятение, ибо каждый слышал их, говорящих его наречие. Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Sie entsetzen sich aber alle und wurden irre und sprachen einer zu dem anderen, was will das werden? Die anderen aber hatten ihren Sport und sprechen, sie sind voll süßes Weins. Well, I have felt the Holy Spirit um, several times over the years, but one particular time that it really stood out to me where I really learned about the Holy Spirit is when I was 20 years old. Uh, John and I had gotten married in 69, and uh, we were sent to Holland, and uh, he had already been there for a while, and uh, came home, and we got married, and uh, just before our first anniversary, um, the Air Force decided they were sending him to Vietnam, and uh, that was a very hard time in my life especially being a newlywed, and I um, remember I was at church and I was just having a really hard time, and um, Reverend Milbury, the pastor that married us, was still our pastor here at the church, and uh, he did an altar call, and I had never done an altar call before, and I don't remember if, if he had, but I really felt pulled to go up and kneel at this altar. And, um, and I just remember I was just sobbing. And, uh, and he talked to me and I told him how concerned I was about my husband. And um, I wanted him to come back to me. And, and uh, so I just remember him kneeling also and um, he prayed over me. And I just got this really warm, warm feeling. And the tears were coming, but I was just smiling and smiling. And uh, so after the service, we talked and I said, wow, what happened? I said, I, I got like really hot from my toes all the way up. And I said, um, suddenly I feel joyful and uh, he said, Ruth, you just got filled with the Holy Spirit. Amen. And uh, so that was just so, so amazing mm -hmm. to me. And I will never, ever forget that pastor. Mm -hmm. And um, he was a pastor of our youth group and everything. And I just felt like I really kind of grew up through my teens until I got married to Wonderful. be with him. Yeah. So that Wonderful. one really, really stands out. Fantastic. So, yeah, wonderful experience of feeling joy and mm -hmm. comfort uh, mm -hmm. in the Holy Spirit at the same time. That's yeah. fantastic. Thank you. Well, this goes back quite a number of years. Now, in the winter of 2001, Ruthie started going to a Bible study called Alpha. And Alpha is a 12-week program that involved uh, having a meal together sharing some humor and watching a video and then discussing the video. And she asked me if I'd like to go. And I really surprised her by saying yes. So I went up to Pastor Betty's house in Woodsville. And I think there were 12 of us in that first Alpha class. And 
As time went on, I felt more and more comfortable being with that group. And it's not that I, I, I wouldn't characterize, characterize myself as not being a Christian, but I, I was one of those twice a year, you know, kind of people. Um, and you know the two dates I'm talking about. So, so I went to the Alpha program, and the last weekend of Alpha involved leaving your home church and going somewhere where you could, you know, be in prayer and just be away from your home church and experience something new. So we went to the, the nun's retirement home in Littleton and spent the day. So we went up there on a Saturday, and one of the opportunities we had was to leave the group and go into prayer with a woman by the name of Lorna. And some of you will remember her, a very good friend of Pastor Betty when she was here. So I went in the room with Lorna and Lorna and I prayed and she prayed over me. She asked if I'd be willing to ask for forgiveness of my sins and to ask Jesus into my heart. And, and I did that. And then this gets kind of emotional. She touched my head as she prayed over me. And when she touched my head, it was a physical thing. It was like electricity went through my body. I get very emotional about this. I haven't talked about it in quite a while. So I knew at that point that something was different about me. And I got up and, and left the meeting with Lorna, the prayer session went up into the, the nun's chapel and prayed. And I was up there for quite a while. And in the meantime, Ruthie and Charlene were panicking. They thought that I had left and hitchhiked home or something. You know, they thought something had happened and I'd been scared away. And then I, I had come back into the meeting with a big smile on my face and started telling everybody what happened. So, so I, I liken myself to Paul in that respect. You know, he was on the road and, and uh, Jesus blinded him and, and he was just a changed person. So I like to say my name was Saul and now it's Paul, but really it's John and John is a good biblical name too. So, so anyway, uh, I was changed. I became a whole new person. I, I, it's really hard to describe. Um, I have talked about this so many times over the years. I, I just told Pastor David I had given sermons on this as, as a, my, one of my many opportunities as a lay leader to share my experience. And every time I talk about it, I get emotional. And a lot of you have heard the story. And I always am tempted to say, I'm sorry for repeating it. And then I get there thinking, no, I'm not. I'm not sorry because you may have forgotten what happened to me. And I want you to understand that it can happen to you if it hasn't. Now, everybody's experience obviously is different. Mine was dramatic. And that's why sometimes I hate to talk about it because I, I don't want the people to feel like I'm throwing it in their face, you know, that, well, I'm a Christian. I had a supernatural experience and I know God now because you know God also. And you've also been through your own experiences. But for me, that was an eye-opener. It was life-changing. And that's what I have to say about it. I could talk for a long, long time. And I, I have, haven't I? Mm -hmm. Some of you out there know. <laughs> but it is. It's a life-altering experience. And just knowing Jesus, I think, I think the, the most important thing for me is that I take comfort now that I'm getting older in knowing where I'm going someday. I mean, I never thought about dying. I have, I don't remember be, being younger and thinking, well, I, you know, I'm afraid I'm gonna die, you know, what's gonna happen? I, I don't remember that ever happening, but certainly now I know where I'm going and I, I don't fear death at all. I don't wanna die today, but. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Said. <laughs> Super. <laughs> Thank you, John. I appreciate your coming in.
Our second reading today comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 6 through 16. Before we read the scripture, let us pray. God, we thank you for your word and for the many ways you continue to speak to your people. Lord, that you would instruct our hearts today as we hear these words, and that you would open our hearts and minds to your will, that we would be your disciples in Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 6 through 16. We speak a message of wisdom among the mature, but not the wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age, who are coming to nothing. No, we declare God's wisdom, a mystery that has been hidden and that God destined for our glory before time began. None of the rulers of this age understood, understood it, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. However, as it is written, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, and what not human mind has conceived, the things God has prepared for those who love him, these are the things God has revealed to us by his Spirit. The Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except their own spirit within them? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. What we have received is not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, so that we may understand what God has freely given us. This is what we speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit, explaining spiritual realities with Spirit-taught words. The person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, but considers them foolishness and cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the Spirit. The person with the Spirit makes judgments about all things, but such a person is not subject to merely human judgments. For what is known, what, I'm sorry, who has known the mind of the Lord as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Thanks be to God for giving us his word. Amen. I have to tell you that Pentecost is one of my favorite Sundays. The gift of the Holy Spirit given to the church is an amazing reality. God has given the church his very spirit, the Holy Spirit, that we enjoy together as the church. It is on this day of Pentecost that we talk about the birth of the church. That means the church got its start because of God's Holy Spirit given and empowering the disciples. As the church today, we still receive and enjoy that relationship with God's Holy Spirit. That's been part of our series as we've been talking about the Holy Spirit for the last three weeks, to talk about how we connect with God. Now, the reason we got into this series was realizing that as we are doing this social distancing during this time of uh, the pandemic, we wanted to focus on how it is that each of us connect with the power of God in our own lives. And we've talked about several different ways in which we receive and connect to that power of God. A couple weeks ago, we talked about this word called paraclete. Jesus tells the disciples that he will send to them the paraclete. And we know that he's talking about the Holy Spirit. But the word paraclete is a Greek word that is unfamiliar to us. It has several meanings. First, he was talking about how he will be an advocate, basically a guidance counselor who comes alongside of us, who helps us navigate in life to understand uh, what it is that we need from God and how it is that God is instructing us and, and guiding our lives. He also talks to us about the Holy Spirit as the paraclete being our comforter. And last week we talked about how the Holy Spirit comes and holds us in his hand and cares for us and provides comfort for us in our times of need. He comforts us and strengthens us for his ministry. Today we're going to focus on the idea of the Holy Spirit as our teacher. Jesus had told the disciples that he would send them the Holy Spirit if they waited for him, and they waited for that gift that the Holy Spirit was to be given to them. He helps them understand something of what the nature is of that gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, the Holy Spirit wasn't a brand new idea to the disciples, because the Old Testament had talked about the Holy Spirit. In Ezekiel, we hear these words from Ezekiel 36. God had promised centuries earlier that a new heart he was going to give to them, 
a new spirit I will put within you, and I will take away your heart of stone and turn it into a heart of flesh. I will give you a heart that is filled with the spirit, and you will cause you to walk in my statutes, and you shall keep my judgments and do them. What is being described in Ezekiel is that God had tried to find ways of instructing his people. He had given to Moses the tablets of stone and, and gave them instruction so that people would know what God's design and hope is for people's lives, how they could live in a way that was pleasing to God. But just like those tablets were written on stone, sure enough, people became legalistic in following the rule, and somehow their heart became far away from God. Even though the instructions were supposed to help bring them close to God, it seemed to have had the opposite effect. As people's hearts became hardened and became focused on legalism, they became further distanced from God. God's solution to this is that he himself is going to pour out his Holy Spirit into the lives of the believers so that the Holy Spirit within them would transform their hearts of stone to hearts that are soft and responsive to the work of the Holy Spirit in their lives. Now, this is not just about external behaviors, because we know that the external behaviors stem from something deep inside. And what God's hope is, is that if the Holy Spirit dwells within the believer, it will transform our hearts and transform our lives from simply changing our behaviors on the outside to having a full life change, a full transformation of who we are, so that we would live according to God's ways for us, as God lives within us and changes us to be as God. That is, in our nature, we were created in God's image. That's who we're called to be. But too often, we live out of a sinful nature, a nature that is not from God. So God's plan for the Holy Spirit is to shape our lives, to bring instruction for our lives, so that we will live in ways that are pleasing to God. So God had promised this through the Old Testament. Jesus had made the same promise to the disciples. He says, I will give you another who will continue to teach you and remind you of all the things that I have taught you. So we think of the teaching ministry of Jesus and what a great teacher Jesus was. As he walked along the fields, he would point out to the disciples, look to the fields, see how they're ripe for harvest. Or maybe he would look at the fig tree and he would see how it was withered and he used that as an illustration. When Jesus preached, people listened. He spoke with authority and with power. And people would say, what new teaching is this? And with such power and authority. What that means is that his words, the words of God, pierced their heart. And they knew that they weren't just listening to something of good interest or more story. But when they heard Jesus preaching, the very mind of God opened their heart to say, I need to change my life. I need to live my life in line with what God would have for me. And so when we think about the great teachings of Jesus, the Sermon on the Mount or the Sermon on the Plain or many of the parables, the entire point of Jesus' ministry was to bring our lives in line with God so that we might experience God's presence in our lives. And so Jesus, when he talks to the disciples about another who would come and teach, the primary piece of that was that the disciples would be reminded and taught of Jesus' words. In fact, in the early church, there was no Bible for them to remember. The Gospels were written many years later, some as far as 70 or 80 years later, after the death and resurrection of Jesus. So what did the disciples do during all that time that they didn't have the Bible to remember the Gospels and the story of Jesus' life and the parables? Well, they prayed. And it was the Holy Spirit working with the church to remind them of all the times that Jesus had been with them his stories, the ways he had healed people, and even more than just the stories and the information was how it felt to be with Jesus, what it was like to experience God incarnate walking with them, to feel his power and his presence in their lives. The Holy Spirit continued to remind them and to shape them according to God's teachings through Jesus, so they would know who he was. You see, the primary role of the Holy Spirit is not to give some new teaching or to test about something else but to testify in glory about who Jesus is. The Holy Spirit directs us to understand and to know the teachings of Jesus. This is why it's often said that when we read the scripture, the Holy Spirit walks with us through the pages, through each word, 
to awaken our minds to what God is saying to us. In fact, it says in the Bible that no scripture is actually written on its own. Instead, the scripture is written as the Holy Spirit directs the writer that they would reflect on the work of the Holy Spirit. Essentially, the scriptures are a recording, a memory of what God has done. And as we listen to the Holy Spirit and read through the scriptures, it reminds us of what God has done. It should inspire us in our lives today. In fact, it is the testimony of the life of the Holy Spirit which is written in the scriptures. So the early church, as they listened to the scriptures and as they listened to the words of God, they were informed by the Holy Spirit first and foremost, even without the Bible itself. The testimony of the early church was a reliance on the Holy Spirit for instruction and teaching to be reminded of who Jesus was so that it would continue to follow in the direction that Jesus had called them to. But more than that, the Holy Spirit was also going to teach them more, because Jesus said to the disciples, I have so much I want to tell you, but you cannot bear it right now. This is coming from the Gospel of John. But Jesus told the disciples that when he goes to the Father, he will send the Holy Spirit to them, and the Holy Spirit will remind them of everything he had taught them, and he will reveal to them truths that they had not yet known, so that the fullness of the instruction and teaching of Jesus would become alive in them by the power of the Holy Spirit. He describes the Holy Spirit in a few ways that I think are helpful to know what that teaching is about. The first, he says, is that he will guide them into all truth. Truth. We should be seekers of truth as believers, not holding on to any hint of darkness or gray matter. Sometimes as we think about all sorts of issues around our day, there's very little that seems to be true or untrue. There seems to be a lot of gray ground. And even while we don't understand the fullness of something, our intention as believers should always be to seek out what is true, to understand what is fact. And when we don't know, we should be honest about what we don't know. And when there seems to be great, to, to express that as well. But not to hold on to something that's untrue simply because of some bias. The spirit of truth leads us to embrace what is true from God and to let go of those things that are not from God so that we might embrace God's truth for us. He also reveals to us what Jesus is giving to the Holy Spirit to share with the church. Now, the word reveal means to uncover. And the idea to uncover is that there are things we don't know that God has in store for those who believe. That's coming from the passage we read this morning in 1 Corinthians. And as he reveals those truths to us, we are uncovering those truths for those who believe. Now, that revelation is not only about what it is that God's doing for us in the moment, but it's also talking a bit about the future, where it is that God is leading us. We know that Jesus has gone before us to prepare a place for us, but the Holy Spirit works in and out through our own time, guiding and directing our steps to be a part of God's great work, God's mission in all the world that all people would give glory and honor to God. The Holy Spirit continues to reveal what is to come for the church and for his believers. And so as we come to that day of Pentecost, when God poured out the Holy Spirit on the disciples, we begin to see how the Holy Spirit is directing the church. It is given the testimony that the Holy Spirit directed the disciples to speak in tongues. They went out into the streets, and as it was described, all the various nations of the world that had come, they were hearing the gospel in their own language, even the languages the disciples didn't know beforehand. But the Holy Spirit gave them words, gave them understanding of how to speak in other tongues. And as they proclaimed the gospel on the streets in Jerusalem, People came to know and experience the gospel and praised God because of the miraculous sign of the speaking in tongues. See, the speaking in tongues itself is actually a sign of God breaking into human history and removing human sin. The idea is that as we come to know the power of God, he directs our steps. And the Holy Spirit was giving them words as to what they would say. That idea that the Holy Spirit provides for us the words that we need to say in ministry and in life is a theme throughout the Bible. The disciples were often told, don't worry, 
about what to say if you get brought before the captors, because in that very hour, the Holy Spirit will give you the words to say. As we read through the Gospel of Acts, maybe the stoning of Stephen, we can hear how the Holy Spirit is speaking through Stephen so that people would be taken to the heart to hear what God is saying to them. The idea is that the Holy Spirit directs our words and provides instruction for those who believe so that we would know what it is he was telling us so that we might give glory to God and provide witness and to give testimony for what God is doing in our lives and a sign to the nations that God is deed, indeed alive. I'll just stop for a moment and just give a side note to know that we are in a process of going through a class on the gifts of the Holy Spirit. If you haven't had a chance yet to sign up to be a part of that, I invite you to go to our website uh, right there on the Grow tab. That means to grow in Christ. I invite you to click on the tab about the Holy Spirit class, and I'd be glad to contact you and help you understand the spiritual gifts that God has given to you and how to explain and understand all of the gifts that God would have for his church. So as we were talking about this day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit was directing the disciples that they would be empowered by his words and directed by his instruction for them, even before their captors, but also that he would lead them in a continued experience of the early church. Often they would gather in upper rooms and in places, and they would pray. And as they prayed, God would speak through individuals about what God is doing. He raised up in their communities, within their own living rooms, people who were prophets, people who could interpret the speaking in tongues to give instruction for the church as a whole, leading them forward. On one time, when the church was gathered together, they prayed and asked uh, God what they were to do in response to the many people who were coming to the gospel, particularly those who were of a faith other than the Jewish faith, and they were coming to know Christ, and they asked, what are we going to do? And the Holy Spirit said, I want you to set apart Paul and Barnabas for the ministry so that I will direct them to reach the Gentiles. How did they know that? It was because of the guidance and instruction of the Holy Spirit. You see, it is the work of the Holy Spirit to help us to grow as the church and to know of his will for us. As I described, as the church continued to grow, they wrote and recorded the words of the Holy Spirit in their lives and experience and that's what we have in Scripture, the testimony of the New Testament. And as they live their example of what that is, the words were written. Now, as we think about being led by the Holy Spirit and led by the Scripture, I will say this, that God is not a God who contradicts himself. God does not lead people in a way that is contradictory to what he has already shared in the Scripture. So if God is leading us in such a way, we need to also explore and understand what the Scripture would say for us so that we would give testimony and glory to God. In fact, what it was said about the Holy Spirit reminding us of all that he has taught, the scriptures continue to provide for us insight as to what the Holy Spirit is saying, and even the, script, the Spirit can speak to us of scriptures that we haven't yet read. One time I was on the street and I was sharing the gospel with somebody who was an atheist and, and didn't believe, and as we were talking more and more about their faith and, and where they were in their journey, they came to know Christ, and they began to tell me about how they had been supported by a group, the AA group, a 12-step community that helps people work through addiction. And they began to tell me how it is like the whole body that is pulled together. You know, they're all different, but they have one purpose, one head. You know, even though we have a hand and a foot and we have shoulders and, and noses and ears, we're all different, but we're all held together in one. Well, guess what? That's 1 Corinthians 12, when Paul talks about how the body is pulled together. And I believe that the reason that person was able to pull that analogy together was because the Holy Spirit began to work within them to understand their place in the body of Christ. The Holy Spirit continues to work within us that we would give glory to God. So what do we make sense of this? How do we allow the Holy Spirit to teach us? Well, if we want the Holy Spirit to be our teacher, we need to start by having a teachable heart. We cannot allow, we cannot uh, just hope and assume that God's going to impress knowledge on us, but we have to have an attitude that is asking. Essentially, thinking about cultivating, Jesus told the parable of the seeds, and he said the farmer goes out and he pours out the seeds, and, and some of the soil is receptive, and when it's receptive, it grows and is able to have a harvest, even a hundred times more than what is sown. But the other types of the soil, whether it be on the road or amongst the rocks or amongst the weeds, 
it doesn't grow. Part of the work in our life to be teachable is to make sure that our hearts are receptive, that we might take the time to listen and to obey what God would say for us. So immerse yourself in the scriptures. How do we begin to hear and to know the voice of God? Well, we begin by hearing what God has said in the past, and it helps to attune our ears to what God would say to us today. Spending time in the Word helps to shape our hearts according to what God would say to us. But also, we can't assume we're going to learn just on the fly. Having a, a Bible on your bookshelf doesn't do you any good. Unless we spend some time each day listening to God, it is hard for us to hear from God. Often in our times of prayer, it's simply us talking to God. But if we're going to be teachable, we also have to listen. We need to open our ears and hear what God would say to us. We need to ask the Lord to direct our actions and our attitudes, even our attentions, so we would hear what he would say to us. God desires for us to know his hand of guidance and instruction in our lives. Let us pray. God, we thank you for the Holy Spirit that you have sent to your church that you might instruct our hearts, and that you would guide our steps. Lord, this day as we hear your word, we recognize that there is so much that we are missing out on by not listening to you. God, I pray that you would pour out your spirit on each one who hears this video. Lord, that they would draw close to you, and that they would hear your voice and listen to your instructions through the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen.
Well, this concludes our worship service together. I hope that today you've heard something from God that has stirred in your heart that you would take the next step in connecting with God. If we as a church can be of help to you, I invite you to look into our website, haverhillumc.org, and click on some of the tabs as we talk about growing in Christ, responding in care and service to our community. Reach out to me if you'd like. I would love to talk with you, spend some time with you on the phone so that we might grow together and learn as God would direct us. And now as we end the service, I invite you to turn your hands to God in whatever way might feel comfortable for you as we receive his blessing. Lord, that you would pour out your blessing and your Holy Spirit on each one, that we would know of your love and of your instruction for our hearts. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Go in peace.